Now, Mr. Dale, we're going to continue our interview with you so that we can get to learn a little bit more about you and your role in Anacostia and hopefully some of the history in Anacostia uh, that we didn't get last time. We talked last time very generally about what you remembered about growing up in Anacostia and some of the institutions and those kinds of things. We want to ask you some more rather detailed questions today. And um, as I told you when we came, we're going to ask you all the hard ones today. <laughs> we're very much interested in the institutions as you recall them. Can you tell us, for instance, we've been back into Barry Farms now to take a look at it. Um, I'm interested in knowing more about the Lodge Hall. Do you remember when that was built, Mr. Dale? Well, you mean the Oddfellas Hall down Sumner Road? The one there on Sumner Road, right. In the first place, that was just an ordinary four-room frame dwelling house. It wasn't. When was it remodeled? It's stucco now, isn't it? Isn't I think it is. Part stucco and part this brick veneer, whatever they call it. But uh, when the Oddfellas bought that house, they put all that front on. They shoved the old house back. I see. And they put that front. That front was built there. Uh, oh, after I was married, I'm sure. It was, as I say, a house, just an ordinary dwelling house, about four rooms, two up and two down. And then they remodeled it and put that front on and left a big place upstairs, big room, for them to meet and several other fraternal organizations in the community uh, met there until they all passed out. Insurances came around and, and uh, my people didn't want to uh, go to large meetings and so they paid their little five and ten cents to white insurance companies and the fraternal orders died out. We had some pretty strong Largest American tents, odd fellas. Uh, maybe that was all. We didn't have any Masonic organizations over there. But uh, as I say, now as to when that was built. Uh, that new part was put on there. I don't know exactly, of course, the year, but it was sometime after I'd married in 1907. 1907? That's wow. when I was married. All right. Uh, what kind of impact did, did the lodges have on community life? Did, did their presence in the community Im, you know, improve the quality of life there? I think it did very very much because in those days uh, fraternal organizations their their big part that they played was to help a family where there was sickness they'd go there sit up at night have a committee if it was necessary a person real sick They'd go there and do housework, relieve the immediate family. And they kind of served as a benevolent society. Right. Uh -huh. right. Did you have a burial society? Now, in reading the history of Washington, I've, I've read about uh, the, the burial societies and the various organizations that were formed, particularly after the, the Civil War, to help the, the blacks who were trying to make their way then. We didn't have anything like that in Barry Farms and Costa, except each one of these organizations gave a small amount of money as burial. 
mm-hmm. help with the burial. They paid what they call sick dues, and then at death, they paid what was then a small amount, or to be considered now maybe a small amount, to help now, excuse me. Now, uh, uh, do you know about True Reformers? No. Do you know about Knights of Pethias? Only the names. Well, they were located uh, in town, in Washington. It seems to me I have read recently that where the YMCA is now on 12th Street, that the uh, Knights of Pythians one, once owned that. And that... Uh, owned that land? Owned the building. Because that building was built originally for the Y. That was during Theodore Roosevelt's yeah. office. Now, it might yeah. have been the building for up the, at the corner, as you suggested, yeah, 12th and maybe U. so. Mm-hmm. Now, the true reformers also owned a building. And it seems to me that building was a tenth and new true reformers. Now, those two, they were considered two big organizations, and they were doing uh, possibly what you might call insurance business. Mm-hmm. And then there was the national benefit that did life insurance business, did big business, and suddenly they went out of business. Let me ask you this. Was there a burial ground for blacks in Anacostia? Yeah. Where was the burial ground? Well, the uh, largest one was Jake Moore Cemetery. That was his personal. But were other people buried there? Oh, sure. Not just he, his he family used members. It. See, he, he see. owned the ground and he used it just like Lincoln and oh, I others. See. He sold lots there. Where was that located? Well, you leave uh, Norman, help me out there. Well, this was Stanton Road and where the new big apartment yeah, is well, now. At Stanton Hill at Suitland Parkway? Oh. It's, you go up Stanton Road, up toward uh, Alabama Avenue, Mm -hmm. and the entrance to this big apartment on the left, you see, is right there, opposite where you go into the high school, or junior high school. Oh, yes, where Johnson Junior High is, yes. Well, this this is on on the left of uh, of Stanton Road. Yeah, that's Stanton Oaks, I believe that's what that's called. Yes, and that's where Jake Moore Cemetery was. That whole area, up in... On top of there is where the cemetery was. Folks buried in there. Oh yes, there was a lot of people buried. When they when they redeveloped that hill and built the apartment, what happened to the graves? Well, they made an effort <laughs> to find the people, uh, the relatives of the people who, who were had buried, been buried there, there, so they could. Uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, for a long time. Uh, I think that was considered one of the poorer cemeteries, and a lot of people just wanted to forget about it, you know. It was almost like a potter's field, and uh, they wanted to forget about it. And so uh, I really don't know of anyone, although a lot of people were buried there. I don't it know of anyone condemned, you know. Yeah, they condemned it. They didn't have any access, got to the place where it was hard to get in there, get to it, and uh, they finally condemned it. I when was that, Mr. Dale? Oh, my soul, uh, I couldn't say exactly, yeah, but that's been, been, 20s, I guess. been way the back 20s. then. Yeah, way back then. They condemned that. Now, uh, there was another smaller place there that was owned by Solomon G. Brown, 
Paul Hillsdale Cemetery. And Solomon Brown owned that? He owned the ground, yeah. And as you make that turn off of Stanton to go up, up to the junior high school, it was just at the top of the hill as you turn right to go on over there. That's where it was. Weren't many people buried there. That's a, that was that, known as T Street Hill. That was known as T Street Hill. Yeah. And of course, uh, <laughs> the district people, the authorities, you know, they just closed them up, condemned them. Would that be where the school is built now? No. Or no, oh, beyond that. that. It's in that area. In that, in that area, area of, of the Johnson Junior High School. Yeah, before you get I to see. the school. Right top of the hill there. Right? The apartments are uh, yeah, the built there right. now. So it's a small, small plot of ground. Mm -hmm. Now were the families or uh who were buried there, were those bodies removed and, and reburied somewhere else? I couldn't tell you that. I doubt it very much. Because they just stood there and grew up in briars. For instance, the reason I say that now, my wife's mother and father were buried in Payne Cemetery. Payne. Across the street from Woodlawn. Now that place has has been designated, I think, for for housing. They just cleared it up and and uh, decided to put houses there. Now, so far as I know, and I've been married to her for 66, 65 years, and they never contacted her about removal of her mother and father. Now, that's up there by Angel, up in that area? What? No. no. Payne? Woodlawn? No. It's on Benning Road. On Benning Road? Benning Road, yeah. Oh, I see. Now, Woodlawn is one of the... Oh, all the big cemeteries. That's the one that uh, makes so much to do about. I was thinking about the public housing development. That's mm -hmm. where I was confused. Yeah, I brought in about public housing. They, they had planned to put public housing over there where Payne was. Now, her mother and father, as I said, were buried there. And they never contacted her when they got ready to clear it up and build these. Decided to build some apartments there. <laughs> Are the apartments not, now there? No, they haven't built anything there as usual. I see. They haven't built anything. Mr. Dale, recently in the news there was a uh, mention of a cemetery where, and I believe this is over on Benning Road or in that vicinity, where uh, they discovered John Mercer Langston and Blanche Kelso Bruce were buried. Is that the same cemetery? No, that's Woodlawn. That's Woodlawn. That's, that's right across the street. I see. Now I know uh, where they are. Going out from town, Payne was over there on the left-hand side, and it directly across the that's street. Right. On the right-hand side was this wooden lawn. I see. That's the one All the big shots were buried there. Away. I see. Uh, what's the name? Blanche K. Bruce? And uh, Langston. The Francis family. And all that crowd was buried. That was the, the cemetery. That was the elitist cemetery. Members of my family buried there too. Yeah, my father, mother, your father, mother. At Uncle Woodlawn. Marcus, yeah. Aunt Maddie. Yeah. They're all born buried at Woodlawn. Now, from now, if that's interesting to know because we can get dates if they put them on. The, are there headstones on those graves? My father had a headstone for. For I think I had his name put on there. He put stone there when. My mother died. Who was the mortician? That might be another way of finding out some of these dates that we need. Who was the mortician that buried your your folks? Mason buried. Mason. My folks, my father, my mother, my brother, sister-in-law. Robert G. Mason, funeral home. Then that's the same funeral home that's operated by Mrs. Francis Mason. Right. Okay. All right, that helps us considerably. Um, I've been talking with your son, Norman, and we're very much interested in the piece of property that he has in Barry Farms because it's, while modified, one of the original structures still standing there. And 
your daughter-in-law told me that you, better than anybody else, could probably tell us a little bit about Moses Smith, who was the first owner there. Mm -hmm. What kind uh, of man was he, and what did he do for a trade? So far as I knew, he did laboring work, day work. He, he had no trade that I can recall. Mm -hmm. He just worked uh, by the day, uh, getting a little bit of money for his day's work. And uh, so far as I know, um, did, did he have any children, Norman? No, 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 he no didn't I didn't think so. No. She didn't either. No. Uh, his first wife was Ann. His first wife's name was Ann Smith. I think that's what I saw. How about movie. that, Norman? And I think uh, the second one was Smith Josephine. Was second, right, Josephine, right. Josephine uh -huh. was the second. Was the second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did What did the first Mrs. Smith do? I don't did she recall work? her. You don't remember her? No. What about his second wife, Josephine? Did she work? No, didn't anybody, didn't any wives work they back in those days except taking some washing? Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they stayed home and, and took care of what little man brought there. He, did they? Did the people from Uniontown bring their washing to the people in Barry Farms to have done? Oh no. How, whose washing they did they take in? Well, they, they may have taken in washing, but they went and got it. They Somebody went, went and got it. I see. Now Mrs. Webster, uh, who lived there on Pomeroy, and the same wife stayed there for a while, short while after her mother and father died. She had a horse and some kind of buggy or something, see. And she used to go to town. She used to wash an iron for big people. She washed an iron for Justice, Chief Justice White, among one of them. Mm -hmm. And around up there in that neighborhood, Rhode Island Avenue, 1600 block Rhode Island, I think uh, Justice White lived there somewhere, 1600 block of Rhode Island. Now she, she washed an iron. But she, she, she went and got that Washington. What was Mrs. Webster's first name, do you know? She was originally a hill. Oh, I'm telling you, this thing is something. You could talk about it 24 hours a day. Uh, she came from Montgomery County. Her family owned a lot of ground in Montgomery County enough ground and stock and so forth that they used to have horse shows there every year, the Hill family. And uh, one of the great-grandchildren still lives on part of the ground, but the rest of the white people stole it all. <laughs> That's rather harsh words. <laughs> Might be accurate ones. <laughs> well, this fact, they owned all that ground. Well, well, how, 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 how did they other people get it? What I mean by that? There are legal some, ways of, of stealing. It, that's they? right. Yes. See? Uh, you can loan me $10. And if I never paid, or if I don't pay, and you want to go to trouble, you can go to court and get something to you. some way to down the line there. Time will come when that $10 will show up and you can get it. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. It'd be worth a lot more. That's where all this property in Bear Farm went. Mm -hmm. One see. time, nothing but colored people lived there. See? As a matter of fact, it was decreed that that was the way it should be. Well, and the guys came. Bear Farm again. Uh, Mr. Smith was. Uh, a little more fortunate than some of the other men in that neighborhood because he had the ability to be a shopkeeper, storekeeper. Mm -hmm. He sold wood and coal. Is this is Moses Smith. Moses uh -huh. Smith. And uh, <clears throat> after they started to uh, uh, getting a few people around that neighborhood that had enough to buy, why well, he had a right nice little business. So and. Together with what day's work he could get 
from time to time. He 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 was uh, he did pretty well financially. <coughs> This made it possible to, for him, too, I suspect, to hang on to his yeah, land. Hang on as well as he did. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It was only after he died that he began to, his wife began to slip away from him. I've come across the name Adam Smoot Funeral Home, and I understand it was located near the Bernie School. Was that the only funeral home here in the community? Mm-mm. There was a Mason other? was the first Mason's one. Mason's was the first one. Yeah, he was the first one. There have been Mason's here in Anacostia a long time then. Yeah. I could check on that and see just how many, but way back there, I can tell you that much, way back there, he came to Washington from somewhere in Maryland, George W. Mason, and set up that... Uh, that was the father of Robert Mason? Father of Robert, George W. And when he came, there was a white man, an undertaker, down in Anacostia, see, among the white people, right across the street from where the bank is now. And he had been burying all the colored people. Oh, really? And when Mason came, first one that came to him after Mason settled, he told him, say, you go get Mason. Get one of your own people, help him. He had, uh, he was the only one in the whole of Anacostia and possibly out and Prince George Mason, so he had plenty. <laughs> he had what plenty was the name of the white mortician? Murray. Was it Murray Simmons? No, Murray. Morley was the original, and he gave it to Simmons boys. One of them came. Is that the one that's on Good Hope Road now? Simmons inherited the business from Murray, and he did business at the old stand, <laughs> Murray's place, across the street from the bank. And finally, the Simmons brothers went up on Good Hope Road and built, and sold the property there on Nichols Avenue. Mm -hmm. What was Nichols Avenue called? I've forgotten. Before it was, it was named after one of the uh, presidents. That end of uh, Nichols Avenue, wasn't it? Was well, president or the doctor at the hospital? No, the lower end of Nichols. Well, what I call the lower end of Nichols Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, down near where the Anacostia Bank is. Mm -hmm. Now that was part of the Uniontown track, and those streets I understood were all named after the presidents. So that entire avenue wasn't called Nichols Avenue then, was it? I think it was now. Well, we can check that. Talking about the presidents, uh, the side streets were named. Were named I after see. President Franklin Street. But that was all uh, Nichols I Avenue. Think Nichols all Avenue. Right. Was, okay. Uh, was Nichols from the beginning. <clears throat> You mentioned that Solomon G. Brown had the Hillsdale Cemetery, and that was on T Street Hill. Mm -hmm. Now, he's one of the people that we're interested in knowing more about. We know he worked for the Smithsonian. Uh, I also read in that paper um, of Mr. Smoots that you were kind enough to share with us uh, that Solomon Brown organized a, an annual uh, pilgrimage, I guess is the word, to go to Harpers Ferry. Did you ever take any of those trips to Harpers no. Ferry? No, I know. <laughs> I was a youngster in those days, maybe before. I know it was before I married, and after I married, I didn't have time. <laughs> Where did Solomon Brown live in, in, did he live in Barry Farms? Yeah. Where did he live? He lived on, I don't think it was called Elvin Road then. It may, it may not even have a name. But uh, you've been up that way. You go up Stanton Road to Elden Road, and you turn right. And they have built some apartments on the left-hand side. There's a small church there. And uh, some man built a nice-looking bungalow there. And 
keeps it up or did keep it up and all that, although I, I never saw him. In fact, I, I've heard other people say they never saw him. Next to that, going on down Elvin Road is a big house. Of course, it wasn't that way when Solomon lived there. Is that is that place still frame or? Well, that's the one that you said. Uh, the one next to that uh, bungalow was Levi Brown's house. Yeah. That's a brick house. Yes, is it brick? It's but brick. that was the original Solomon G. Brown right. house. But I think all that's gone now, isn't it? I don't know. And uh, oh, those what's apartments. It, uh, apartments in there? Yeah, now. Just that one house next to the church was left, and I think the rest of them are out, all the way down to Penn. So that's that's the same uh, part of Elvin's Road that Mrs. Lowry lives on? Yes. Mm -hmm. She lives down at the down end. Down at the end. I read in Mr. Smoot's paper that there was a white school teacher who lived in Barry's farm and who lived there until she died. Do you know who that might have been? No, you got my name. No. Were there white remember. and black school teachers teaching at Bernie School? No. Not, not in my time. Not in your time. I guess if there was one there, she must have come into the community with the Freedmen's Bureau. Quite likely. Mm -hmm. And that was really before public schools uh, were set up in that area, see, mm -hmm. the Bernie and the Hillsdale School. Uh, it, she could have been at that time, but uh, I don't remember as far back as I can go. It was the old segregated Dual, what do you call it? The dual school system. System, see? Mm -hmm. And all the teachers, and I think principal, of Hillsdale and Bernie were colored. We had white supervisors mm -hmm. and white special teachers, such as Carpenter Shop. Uh, I, I remember him for some reason. His name was Powell. He was a white man. He had charge of Carpenter Shop and he came maybe once a week, something like that. Uh, and I uh, say the other top people, they were all white people. We did have colored principal. First one that I can recall was Miss Florence Smith. She was principal of Bernie. Did she live in the community? No. She lived across town somewhere. Did most of the teachers at Bernie live in the community? Well, now, we didn't have too many teachers, but there were two, uh, one of them, one of them who lived, and her, her father was one of the original settlers. Her name was Smith. That was Miss Emma Smith? Emma Smith, uh -huh. Miss Emma Smith. She lived on Howard Road. Has her house been torn down, Norman? Yes. It, uh, her house was just across the railroad track. It's the second house across the railroad track. And there were houses across the track where the highway is now? Yes, oh yes. There were houses all the way down on both sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, Miss Emma Smith lived in the second house, and Graham's lived uh, there's a little distance in there. Uh, probably 50 or 100 feet, 150 feet, then Graham family, and then the next was Shipley. And the original family, excuse me, the original family, that was Johnson, if you mm -hmm. recall. See, Shipley married one of the Johnson girls. Right. The original family was Johnson. Now, uh, Johnson girl and Phillips girl, Marveline Phillips, were substitutes. They lived in the community. But the regular teachers, as I say, so, uh, except for Miss Emma, I think they all lived 
across the river in town somewhere. Now, Phillips was one of the original settlers, settlers over there. And his daughter, Marveline, uh, was substitute. And uh, who's the other one I said was substitute? Marveline Phillips. And uh, Johnson. Johnson, what was her name? She married Shipley, a druggist. That's, is that the same Dr. Shipley um, that had the pharmacy? Right. All right. Did he build the Douglas Hall? No, he did not. Because I had come across that in someone else's recollections. Mm -hmm. Who built the Douglas Hall? No, that I haven't been able to find out. I don't think it's in that paper even. That Mr. Howard and his committee. I don't know who built that hall. I don't know whether Fred Douglas built it or... It was named after him. I, uh, that's the reason it was called mm -hmm, Douglas Hall. Mm -hmm. But just who built it, I, I, I don't recall that I ever heard. Um, I've been reading um, the transcription of an interview with a Mrs. Crocker, who lives in New York. And in her recollection, she says that Mrs. Frederick Douglas Jr. taught in Anacostia. Did she teach at Bernie? Do you remember her? Do you remember? That would be Fred Douglas' son, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, in the city directory for the 1870s, I found listed all three of the Douglas sons. Do you have any idea where they would have lived in the area? Did your father, maybe, or anyone ever know where they lived? Um, on Nichols Avenue, let me see. A little above Suitland Parkway that runs around there and goes under Nichols Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a big house. And I have been told that one of Fred Douglas' sons lived in that house way back there years ago. Now, that's the best I can do with that. And so far as I knew, other than that, that house, that one place where I was told that one of the sons lived, they lived across town somewhere. Mm -hmm. You got anything to put in there, Norman, there in time? No, except that the name of the family that he, that subsequently moved in there was Mills. The name of the family was Mills. And there's a grandson that lives out here. He probably can tell you something. And that's the house that Frederick Douglass Jr. lived in? Well, I don't know whether it was Frederick J Douglass Jr., but one of the sons. Mm-hmm. One of the sons. And I, I of course, that house. Yes, they all fine. That house is gone now. But maybe this, this uh, fellow Mills can help you. He can. He probably can help you, mm -hmm. and I'll put you in touch with him. Norman, when you were working on that booklet for the Campbell AME Church, did you come across any photographs of the old sites in the area, like Eureka Park or Green Willow Park or... Any of those? Did no. people come and bring you all kind of gems they've got stored away? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I uh, I tried to get people to give us all materials that they would have, but in many cases, uh, our people have more or less tended to do away with any records of past. It's, it's very difficult mm -hmm. to find pictures or any written documents. Now, even at our church, <clears throat> uh, of all the, the great fine things that have happened at Ca Campbell, well, we don't have any records of it except documents like that. And there's several uh, 
uh, souvenir programs that have been put out from time to time will have some bits of information in them. You just have to. And I don't believe uh, the ministers have been interested enough to get the church clerk to file any of those copies in a safe and keep it at the church. I, people that I appointed to the program committee had to scrounge and pick up this information the best they could. Mm -hmm. They couldn't find any records. The photographs that are in that book, do you have those? Uh, were they all kept together, those that you were yeah. able to, to get? Well, we gave them back. You gave them back to yes, the... Yes, gave them back to the people. Does the church have records of such things as um, marriages and baptisms and burials that might be uh, checked? Well, they should, but uh, if they have any, they are more recent. What I mean by that would be records of... Maybe they probably wouldn't have any records of my generation, but uh, the younger people, they might have some of them. I see. <laughs> Every time somebody died, they'd come to me and want to know yeah, how well, old they were. <laughs> when did they join church? Oh, are, you, are you the church historian, Mr. Dave? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, no, they don't have any The church does not have a historian. But they just knew that... Uh, I've been there a long time. long time. I knew a lot of people, knew a lot of things about things that happened. And they had no written records, so they came to me. I see. Every time somebody would die, they want to know when they joined church and who was the pastor and, and uh, how old they were and this and the other. And that's the way it's going. And as Norman said, the ministers don't seem to take any interest in we, it. We need to do this. We need more no, documentation. Yeah. That's the reason I am putting in this time with you, trying to get some of this we stuff down. Pleased. Listen, let me tell you this. Excuse me. <laughs> Al Moore's boy, oldest boy, John, John Ivan. That boy came here about two weeks or three weeks ago. My wife and I stay in the middle room there, what they call the den most of the time now because particularly in the wintertime, this big open space here. Anyway, we were back there. He came back, and we talked a few minutes. And then he, all of a sudden, he said, uh, Grandpa, I want to find out something about who I am. I said, what you mean, boy? He said, well, who were my grandparents? Where did they come, where'd they come from? The boy almost knocked me off my chair. Mm -hmm. So I gave him a copy of what my father had written about where the Dale family came from. And on down the line until I married and said, now that's where you come in, in this number four, Dale family <laughs> number four. He never did tell me why. He so suddenly asked, and I didn't know whether it was in connection with his schoolwork, he could back up that house now, or what it was. But anyway, it, it showed to me that these sort of things are necessary. Now, that boy wants to know, he, until I told him, maybe, he didn't know anything at all about his family tree. Although I gave each one of my children a copy. They, they don't know where it is now. <laughs> Uh, and they tried to tell me I didn't give it to them. <laughs> but I gave each one of them a copy. And that shows how we, uh, spread this out among, of course, one thing about it is, you know, one thing about it, today and for years, I'd say maybe the last 20, 25 years, more or less, since our people, some of them, Lord bless them, and they come in to kind of get on their feet. They don't want to hear nothing about back there. I've had them say to me, don't go talking about no <laughs> slaves. That's unfortunate. In the door. That's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. When are well, you going to put some of the many things that you know down on paper? I'm leaving that to you. <laughs>
I can't but worry But there are many things that I won't know to ask you that you'll know to tell us if you put them on paper. Well, I'll Do tell you, you know, for instance, when all of your children were born, oh, yeah. all of your grandchildren were born? I can't swear about all okay. the grandchildren, but I can tell you about all the children. It, I got that down Since black you and white. have this great sense of history, you, you ought to update the paper your father started. Well, uh, as I said, uh, I have brought it down. Now that you're a gentleman of leisure. I have less time now <laughs> than I did when I was working in the post office, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, 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 well, uh, I'm talking about the time. See, I had to help him see. on that. Uh, uh, it, it is a problem for him to write something, mm -hmm. but uh, I think I'm going to get a tape recorder. A tape recorder would be marvelous. And you see, it is leisure. Whenever we, we get together, yeah. we can talk and make tapes, and mm -hmm. then they can be edited or take off of those tapes, mm -hmm. whatever you want. Transcribe and, and edited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That way, uh, he, he wouldn't have, wouldn't any pressure be on it. Right, because this, uh, this and, isn't uh, easy for him, I know. Right, see, so... So I'm going to do that real soon, and uh, even when we're not here, when I'm not here, and he and Mama are here together. They, they reminisce. They can put it right. on the tape. They can That's right. turn that tape on. and. and well, you get one of those things, I'll yeah. pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's easier and cheaper All than me right. than sitting down taking yeah. pencil and paper. I'm like my father. <laughs> he worked until he was 70 years old. He was a clerk. And back in his early days, in fact, up the time he left, retired. He didn't have typewriters. Everything was done in longhand. In longhand, yes. All the, the uh, cases of, of soldiers, done in longhand. <laughs> so he, when he said when he retired at 70, he said, I ain't going to push another pen <laughs> for nobody. <laughs> Let's go back to Solomon G. Brown. Uh, I've been curious. I had heard. Um, again, we, we, we're trying to find things that have been written or published as well as having these conversations. Uh, I had heard that he had helped to work, I believe, with the Morse code. You know anything about that? What did he do at the Smithsonian? Do you know? No, he I don't. He had a job he of was, some responsibility. He was considered uh, to be a uh, well-rounded out man, well, one intellectually and otherwise, maybe the best, if not the best, among uh, one or two others. I think he wrote poetry. He Was any of it ever published? No, not that I know of. And he organized the first Sunday school there in Anacostia or in Bear Farm. And uh, he was all all around man. What you would, would say today or years later, men like in the school system, Garnet Wilkinson and those sort of people. Mm -hmm. Although he had no college education, he was just gift from God, but he was considered, I, I can recall that as the big man, we say. Nowadays, sometimes, big shot. In and Mr. Um, Smoot's paper, he talks about uh, Solomon Brown organizing this pilgrimage to Harpers Ferry. Were there any other days of commemoration of importance to the community of Anacostia that you can recall? special events for celebration. For right. instance, did they celebrate Emancipation Day in the community? And there's something in, that, in his paper about that. They had a big parade uh, on the anniversary of uh, Emancipation or something like that. They How long, as, as you can recall, was that a day of celebration in Anacostia and in the city? Oh, I, I don't know about in the city, but over there in Bear Farm, Let's see, I've been married 65 years, and I was a teenager 
Well, that was, I wasn't much more than a teenager when I got married, was I? No. Anyway, I'd say that was at least uh, 75, 80 years ago. Well, when did we stop celebrating? If you talk to young people in Anacostia today about Emancipation Day, unless they're talking about the Emancipation Proclamation in January, they don't know anything about Emancipation Day in April. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when did we lose those things? Uh, they must. It must have. I don't recall any celebrations, real celebrations. Uh, for Emancipation Day in my early days after the parks were done away with Green Willow and Eureka. Now, they used to have, there used to be a big occasion, see, they'd have this parade and, and they'd go to the parks, one of the parks, or maybe both of them, and have a big dance and whatnot, see. But Was there any speech making on that day? Well, I, I really don't know because I it's such a... No, I don't remember. They simply but celebrated it by you, having, having and Willow. a good time. By having this parade yeah. and winding up and parade around a few streets in the community and wind up at the park. And generally, generally they had a big piece of beef, which you all, I guess, would like to have it now. Yes, either the whole, prices won't permit. Either a whole cow or half a cow. <laughs> barbecue. Barbecue, uh-huh. Wind up by having this barbecue. Now, the, the, the Willow Green Park, as I understand it, was down at the end of Howard Road? No. Sumner Road? On oh, Sumner, not at the Sumner. end, either. It was located, uh, I would say, just about or a little b below the field house, it's, Where I Bernie? call it, the field house of uh, Barry Farm uh, Playground. Barry Farm, the recreation center yeah. there. Yeah, uh -huh. just a little below that was this Green Willow Park. Man now, Eureka name, Park was down uh, on Nichols Anthem Avenue. On Nichols Avenue, right where... They say not far from where Southeast House is. Southeast that South. would be Mars Road mm -mm, and, uh, mm -mm, and, and mm -mm, Nichols. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. This, they backed up. They, these two parks backed right up to each other. One entrance to one was on Nichols Avenue, and the other one was on Sumner Road. Eureka was on off of Nichols Avenue. Off of Nichols Avenue. A family named Greenfield took care of the Eureka Park. They lived right in front of it. And there was a driveway going down alongside their house. Now, the lot extensions for both parks backed right up to each other. Green Willow back this way and Eureka that way. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. The Suitland Parkway Park wouldn't no, have been no, there. No, Suitland no. Park wasn't there. Wouldn't wouldn't have been, been, no, it wouldn't have been this there. This was a good good piece up from Suitland Parkway. It's probably uh, a block from Suitland Park driveway where it is mm -hmm. now. Shooting came in FDR's time. Yeah. When he was making work during the Depression and connected that up with Bowling Field and Anders Field. That's that was a part of the WPA or the CCC? Yeah. yeah. Did they have the fellows doing that? Right. Uh, uh, you started to tell me something, and I interrupted you. I'm sorry. You were going to tell me the name of who owned the uh, Willow Green Park. Well, you got the name there. Just a little backwards. Green Willow. Green Willow. Green Willow. Oh. Man by the name of Green owned it. Green owned, owned it. the property. A whole lot of ground there. Uh, going back from Sumner Road, back toward uh, maybe where the highway is now, Suitland Highway. He owned a whole lot of ground in there, and he just fenced it in. Park business, the Eureka had been making big money at it and he, he decided to make some and he fenced his own property in and did a little talking about it and i mean he cleaned up too for a while he didn't like knock of, socks uh, out of did you did they have any that. any kind of equipment or facility there it was just an open space just an open space he built a platform for dancing mm -hmm. that's what it consisted of that you'd come it. over from washington on streetcar and go there and dance a couple hours. 
mm-hmm. youngsters, and boys, young men, young women, and they charge so much admission. Different clubs would have a dance there, uh, and they would charge so much and pay the owner so much for the use of the park. I see. I'll tell you who may, might be able to give you additional information on it. Uh, Naomi Black, that's my cousin. She uh, lives on Nichols Avenue. This green was related to her mother. I see. See, so maybe she might have some records, or she might have some recollection. Uh huh. <laughs> and we need to talk yeah. with her. How, yeah. how old a person is she? She ain't got she's the recollection. A little bit bad. She's, she's around, around my age. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> not. <laughs> I, uh, she's she's uh, a little older than I am. See. She's young. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, but before you go any further, there's one thing I didn't hear you mention about Mrs. Webster, the lady that my mother stayed with mm-hmm. for a while. Now, I think that it was quite an accomplishment for her to uh, to buy her house, and she set it up. For the sewing council, did you ever hear? Is the that the council? house? That's the that's house. the house I'm supposed to visit next week. Well, that's on the house. Pomeroy Road. Yeah, yeah. Now that's mm-hmm. the house that Mrs. Webster had. Right. I was going to ask and, about uh, that sewing council. I think council. Sally Underdo is in there now. She's they tell me there's a Mrs. Green who lives there, and that Mrs. Underdo is the president of the council now. Yes, uh, she. Uh, she's a miss. Miss. Underdue. She's Miss Underdo. And Sally Underdo, and uh, she's living there. But I don't, I didn't know who else was in the house, but uh-huh. that is the house that was turned over to the sewing council when she died, when Miss Webster died. And that's and the original house that's there. Yeah. Yes. How old is now, that they house? Have, Do you know? Uh, mm. this, they secured this property. You know, that group of departments uh, on Stanton, between Stanton and Howard Road, the. Uh, Co- uh, the apartment complex in there next to the shopping center. Banks shopping center? Yes. yes. Well, the sewing council owned all that property that those apartments are built on. Oh, it's really? Been, originally, they owned it and they sold it uh, to this company. That Would it. they have any records there? Well, now, Sally, Miss Underdo, mm-hmm. should be able to fill you in on, since you're going to see her. Yes. Well, she probably can fill you in on all that. Do and you know Mrs. Webster's thing. first name? I got Hill and I got Webster. What is and I that? haven't gotten a first name. Miss uh, Mary. Mary. Mary Hill Webster. Yes, is that it? Was. Originally Hill. And then she was married to a Watson. Then married Webster. Webster was the last one. Last one. Did she and build she that house that Hill family out of Montgomery in Montgomery County. County? That's where she got her money from. I see. Did Mrs. Webster build the house that's on Pomeroy Road? So far as I know, she did, yeah. Do you have any idea how old that house is? Oh, my soul. That house is 100 years old. Uh-huh. More or less. At least I keep on referring to it. Uh-huh. I've been married six, seven years. My wife Everything stayed Everything goes now. back to that. Must have been <laughs> I can marriage. remember Everything that. Everything goes back to that I marriage. I can remember that. And uh, I remember sneaking around there when the wife was there, you know, stayed there. She, <laughs> she used to have to help. All, all comes that. out in the wash. Yeah. She used to help do that ironing, and I'd be sneaking around there and doing a little job for Miss Webster, one stuff and another on the side. So you could see your so, wife. Uh, and so far as I know, Back there, yeah, I'd say 50 years ago, she installed uh, kind of a a water system in that house. She had a bathtub, she had running water in there, and uh, I don't recall whether she had a septic tank or not, but she sure had running water in that house. And there's been no addition, so far as I know, made to it. So it's the original structure that's day. standing there. Yeah, uh-huh. after she died. Norman, Nothing's been added to it, no rooms or anything. Do you know what that address is on Pomeroy Road? Yeah, I think my father just told you. 2328. 2328. 
Can I tell you I was messing around there? <laughs> <laughs> 2328 uh, Pomeroy Road. All right. Was Mrs. Webster the founder of that sewing yeah. council? And her original idea, when she bought, had the council, and that was just made up of a few women in the community in the church. And she got them together and, and named it Sewing Council. And they bought that ground in Normantel to where those apartments are. Are those the Howard, what do they call those apartments there? I That's just it. above the bank shopping center? Right. It, 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 uh -huh. it, uh, it's right next to the shopping center and runs up up the street. Like you're going up toward the Catholic Church? Up toward uh, Stanton Road? Up, yeah, it runs to, to Pomeroy, Pomeroy Road, Road, up toward Pomeroy Road, and it runs back to Howard Road. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. that's over on Stanton Road. Yeah, it starts uh, on they Stanton bought, Road. She bought that all that property, and she had in the back of her head then, and that's been seventy-five years ago or more. Uh, make, there was a big house there. I forget, I don't remember how many rooms, but a man lived there by the name of Hunter. He was a preacher, Reverend Hunter. And after he died and his wife died, she bought, the council bought that big piece of ground, and her idea was to set up a home for elderly people back there then. But, of course, uh, the district soon took that idea out of her head, see? There was no water and sewer in that area. And, and all the, even back there, the things that they required to operate a place like that, so she finally gave up the idea and just held on to the ground. And when she died, well, it passed into the hands of this council, and they finally sold it, that part of it there on Stan Road. And uh, I think she did leave a will, maybe, stating that that, that home was to stay there. Yeah. Her husband was to live in there. Uh, still living. Governor Banks' wife, she was mm -hmm. a member of that council. Right. And she's related to the Banks's. Uh, Jim Banks family. Right, Jim mm -hmm. Banks family. And he, they know where she is. She's in an apartment on 16th Street somewhere now, northwest. Is that Mrs. Hattie Banks? Hattie, right. Well, we're going to see her. Good. We're good. going to see all the right people Somebody that are here. Yeah. yeah. Right. I've good. been reading, Mr. Dale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful because uh, she was one of the sewing council members. Very, yeah. very. Yeah. In fact, we had an appointment to go to the sewing council yesterday, but the rain precluded us not oh, going. Yeah. Because the ladies wouldn't come out in that downpour. Yeah. Well, Mr. Dale, this is going to conclude our interview with you for today. We want to thank you for getting up early <laughs> and uh, being gracious enough to let us come back. I can do it once back. in a while. Once in a while, but not too often. Yeah. All right. We won't impose again for a little while. Uh, it's all right. I'd be glad to. I like to talk about it. That to reminisce. I, as I say, I'm not much on sitting down writing out stuff, but I can talk, oh boy. All right. I can remember a whole lot of things. And we'll hold and Norman to his promise to get the tape recorder. Yeah. All right. Now, um, you say you're about through? Yes. We'd, we'd like to give you a little snack there before you leave. Well, that'd be very I nice. I meant to fix a little something. Uh, 